Thank you, Phil. Um, glad to be glad to be back here, and you know, in the embrace of two of my favorite institutions, New America and the Washington Monthly. Um, I have. A, I want to talk a little bit about the piece that I have in this issue and the broader context. Um, I like the framing of the cover of the magazine and the pitch of the event that these are kind of the ideas that the presidential campaigns aren't quite talking about. Because one of the one of the issues that I've one of the questions I've been dealing with is kind of how did how did our politics and particularly progressive politics how do we sort of lose track of of really creative ideas about how to uh, build security for for middle class families and I think it's hard to I think there are there are definitely good policies out there about you know pumping up the economy and and um, and, and and things we can do but I but I don't feel like there's as robust a generation of ideas and, and fresh approaches that, that really deal with the challenges as there has been in the past. So th one of the things, you know, my kind of larger project over the last uh, six months or so is to really think about how, you know, where do ideas come from? How do you make this happen? How do you inject ideas into the political process? And so one of the, one reason I really wanted to uh, to write a piece about the assets movement was really almost as a as a, as a way of looking at how, as I put it in the piece, you know, not so much how a bill becomes a law, but how an idea kind of gets injected into the mainstream and takes life and gets refined and gets to the point where you can where you can do more with it. Um, one of the things I didn't do in the piece was put uh, put any I in it. I mean, there's 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 none of me in it. Although I wanted to write the piece in large part because this is an issue I've sort of been on the margins of for for a long time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put the I back in uh, in. in in here in this talk a little bit, uh, helped by the fact that this is a kind of this is your life uh, panel for me. As I think, just about every everybody here on the two panels, except for David Leonhardt, has been a colleague of mine at one time or another. Um, so, uh, what's interesting, what, where I first kind of got interested in the ideas of helping use assets as a strategy for building economic security for poor people and the work of Michael Sheradden, which has really inspired the assets program uh, here at New America, was when I was working on the Hill uh, in 1991, 92. I was working for Senator Bill Bradley. Uh, and we were really interested at that. He, there, there were a bunch of things he was interested in. Um, uh, part of it was we needed a way, we, you know, we were, we were, this was the beginning of the welfare wars. We needed a way to talk about poverty and welfare that wasn't just about work requirements and time limits. We needed something that captured a sense of of possibility and human potential that people weren't always defined as, you know, dependent or, 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 or you know, welfare recipients or not, that, that, that people could could uh, get to a different level. We're very affected by the by the statistics that kind of came out starkly in the early 1990s about the difference between uh, African American and white wealth, which is which remains staggering. Um, and there's and there's a whole new uh, round of, of of studies on that. There was a real. I, I mean, if I can, it, it's it may be impossible to. Uh, to pull you back to this moment because it's been so forgotten. But there was a moment at that time when, in a sense, the, the Los Angeles riots of 20 years ago were almost like the Occupy Wall Street of the of today. And that there was a moment when people thought this really will change everything and, and there will be a focus on poverty again that, that we haven't had before. And of course, um, that wasn't true, and it wasn't really true of Occupy either. But um, these are these are how we uh, how we sometimes think about things. Which is to say, when Michael Sheridan came forward with the book Assets and the Poor, and the idea of individual development accounts, which is to say, you've got individual retirement accounts and all the other asset programs for the middle class. Why not do something that help? Uh, that help poor people, you know, actually by saving a little, you match it a lot, and you get people to the point where they have a significant, uh, significant account. Was you know, w it was an idea that answered a lot of a lot of what we were looking for in poverty circles. I mean, this was a poverty debate at the time, uh, and. Uh, and it's you know so it's a it's a bill I remember, you know I remember uh, I, I actually I in the how how ideas catch on I knew Ray Bushara socially um, uh, my boss at the time uh, Ken Apfel who was later the head of the Social Security Administration knew Bob Friedman from the uh, Corporation for Enterprise Development also I think through Tacoma Park circles <laughs> and uh, and and you know so we were kind of connected to this idea and 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 and, and put it together as a bill and. Um, and, and of course, nothing went with it, it, you know. It, it, nothing really came of it, although it did kind of catch on in a, in both in both 
uh, as I say in the piece and as Ray has written, in both kind of liberal democratic circles, conservative democratic circles. It was a big priority of the Democratic Leadership Council, Progressive Policy Institute, and then among those Republicans who were looking for something, uh, you know, uh, so what would later be called compassionate conservatism at the time. So it caught on in a lot of areas. But of course, as as, as Ray's also pointed out, we had no, you know, it was it was purely an idea. I mean, there was no real experience with making these accounts work and actually figuring out what it what was involved in helping people save and those incentives and so forth. I mean, there was there was, we were we were kind of running wild, uh, as as Ray put it. The politics were way ahead of the practice. You know, nobody had really had really done this, and in a way, it's it's almost dangerous sometimes for an idea to kind of uh, get picked up in the political process so fast, um, uh, you know, ahead of the, um, uh, ahead of actually learning what, what works. So in a sense, what happened after that, although there were, you know, there were some grand political proposals, I think Bill Clinton at one, at one point proposed like a, uh, a you know, a, a, a $50 billion program or something like that. Um, now, and what really happened was, you know, the foundations and nonprofits getting involved and really building out this experiment and and feeding back a ton, you know, really almost like casebook how American social policy ought to be developed, you know, which is let's test it, see what works, build things up to scale, use the foundation sector along with government to create some some feedback and information. And they really built up through the American Dream demonstration uh, some some real answers to, to, to how these things work. And now we're in a totally different place. I mean, uh, partly because of the, of, the, uh, of the stagnation of the middle class, um, and 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 the issues that Phil had talked about, we're 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 moving so far in a different direction. One of the things that we, you know, a couple of years ago uh, here at New America, we put together this project on the next social contract. And one of the things that one of the ways I think we think about this, we, we should think about this now, is that you know assets are an essential part of economic security at every level. Assets being having some positive assets as well as manageable debt. Um, so that you're, you know, so that you're looking at overall, overall net worth. Um, the way I often put it is, w when you look at economic security, there's no economic security m better. There's no, there's no basis for economic security that's, that's more reliable than having $10,000 in the bank. Nothing helps you through a rough patch. And if you think about it, I mean, the social contract of the pa the New Deal social contract essentially is a set of social insurance programs of, of various kinds, and whether it's unemployment insurance, disability, and so forth. Um, and social insurance is a brilliant, it's, it's like one of the most brilliant concepts in human history. But there's limits to what social insurance can do, because social insurance is essentially for predictable outcomes, like you know, like short-term uh, unemployment in, in along the business cycle and so forth. Um, so that the next wave of the social contract really has to involve helping ensure that people are invested with those basic flexible assets that uh, that that can that can kind of get people through tough times. That's something you can't do uh, with social insurance alone. Uh, so that that becomes so that that becomes the framework in which you think about these ideas more than just. Um, uh, uh, m more than just thinking about about poverty, um, one of the things I found, one of the things I asked a lot of people uh, in in the course of doing this article, was really the question of whether the financial crisis had, you know, had had kind of thrown thrown this movement, this effort for a loop, because there was a real fundamental problem, particularly with the home. You know, the, there's an there's an assets movement that's looking at, you know, helping people really build economic security, build savings for whether it's for entrepreneurship or home ownership or whatever. And then there was the movement to really uh, uh, imp raise the levels of home ownership uh, for, for poor people. And those are closely linked. Um, I think even though it is it is demonstrably false to say that the movement to increase the rates of home ownership among among poor people caused the financial crisis, it is true that in many cases it wasn't good for those people themselves. That the that the uh, push to to home ownership left them actually more vulnerable and with less assets than they than they had going in. Um, I thought this was an interesting. I, I, I was interested to see how the assets advocates had dealt with that. And really, I think what I found was that. It's almost uh, uh, that that really well structured programs that were real that were not only helping people save uh, but also helping people make sure they were 
you know, they knew what their choices were and were making good decisions about their assets and making good decisions about home ownership at the right time in their lives. I mean, in a sense, these were actually protected. These, these turned out really well. Um, the program in, in North Carolina run by self-help, for example. You know, those people are actually have much more equity in their homes. They, the, the default rates and foreclosure rates are much lower. They're much better off than than a lot of the people who were just, you know, victims of the uh, of the financial industry. So I think it's a really good case uh, for these programs, especially for structuring the programs well. And then the last evolution that we've seen uh, that we've seen here is really been to link uh, the the savings accounts uh, uh, with college, essentially with college promise programs, so that, so that governors, mayors in San Francisco and other cities, for example, are, you know, making that commitment that if you're coming out of one of our high schools and you're, you know, you're basically getting decent grades, we will make sure you're able to go to college. And coupling that with an account in which, in which people can save that brings them and their families into the economic mainstream, creates an expectation of success that isn't there before, and using all these small pieces together. It's a very, very different model from this, you know, rough idea that we latched on to 20 years ago of the individual development account. The individual development account depended on, you know, a big match, sometimes like four to one match of savings to kind of get people up to the point where they had the, uh, uh, where they had sufficient savings. But what, what all the work that's happened since then kind of shows is that if you do this right, you don't need the, you don't need the match to be quite as high. And the match, in a sense, isn't as important as simply having that account, having that expectation, making it easy, tapping into some of the things that we know from behavioral economics about what encourages people to save and the value of savings and expectations. And that together, those kinds of things uh, create a, a, a different kind of asset. So, you know, here, it's, it's, it's been a fascinating, I always feel I look at this movement, it's kind of like... Um, you know, your own, you, you don't realize how quickly your own kids are growing up, but when you have, you know, a nephew or niece or a friend's kid, or I just saw Reed's daughter the other day, you know, if you see kids that you only see every two years or something like that, you, you know, they really leap. So it's been great to, to see this, this idea uh, kind of from afar, but to see the leaps it's taken to the point where it really, it, it's about time that it really does play in a sense that the politics catches up with the practice, as Ray would put it, and that it, it, it's time for it to once again have a much bigger place in the political debate. Thank you.